grace of Christ, my brethren, we will continue today from this series of lessons, the plan of God, the work of God, and the latter days. The work of God and the latter days. And we are reading, we will be reading from Matthew, sorry, Luke, Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21 and verse verse 20 Gospel according to Luke 21 verse 20 but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its desolation is near then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her for there are the days, these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. For there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Last Monday, by the grace of Christ, we read from the Gospel according to Matthew, and indeed from, verse, from chapter 24, from four, verse 4 to verse 8, and there the Word of God described to us the beginning of sorrows, that period, which beginnings of sorrows begin at. At least that is what we assume and speculate from the Word of God, and we'll see why we say this. They begin for the beginning of this century, and they are concluded at uh, around 1948 when the, na the State of Israel was established. And as we believe, then we enter the last generation, by the grace of God, if we're not mistaken. The characteristics of the period which are called the beginning of sorrows is there will be great deceptions who of course will speak about Christ first of all then they will hear rumors of wars and wars and indeed two great wars will take place during that period the world wars they are unique world wars that have taken place until today in humanity the first in 1912 and the second in 1940 and it this, the Word of God describes it as a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and at the same time there will be signs that will reveal and show to men that we have reached the last century the beginning of sorrows the period where the Word of God calls beginning of sorrows and the signs will be hungers famines pestilences Earthquakes in various places, it writes in Matthew, and Mark, the Word of God, in chapter 13, speaks again from verse 5. Mark 13, verse 5 to 8, we see the same things are written, but also he adds another sign. There will be troubles. So there will be famines, pestilences, troubles. And in the Gospel according to Luke, again, for the same period, which is the beginning of birth pangs, birth uh, sorrows. He had something else that are um, signs in heaven, and truly such signs have taken place until 1948. Hungers that grow, that are increasing throughout the whole face of the earth, Re revol revolutions, troubles throughout humanity, the most crucial century in the human uh, history, with great achievements, revolutions, Industrial revolution, financial revolution, social revolution, changes of borders, 
This period was amazing. And the astonishing sign is, as we said, the two world wars that never have happened again. And they won't happen again except in the end of the seven year reign of the Antichrist when the third world war would take place where it will be very destructive. And finally, another marvelous sign is what we read in the Gospel according to Luke, signs in heaven. And for the first time in humanity, we have um, the Air Force. The First World War had Air Force, but especially the Second World War, we see how we saw the growth of the Air Force there. War was won because of the Air Force. And indeed, the first um, bombing, the first... Uh, the first explo nuclear explosion uh, happened in Japan, and then the world war ended. Again, from, he from the sky, this came. We're reading from the... We see where the Word of God describes the first apostolic church in the, in the Gospel according to Matthew, which the main characteristic was that they went through tribulations, through persecutions, the division... Because Christ said, I did not come to bring uh, peace on the earth, but sword. I came to divide a brother from a brother, a father from a son, a daughter from a uh, mother-in-law. And all these things, this division comes because of the word of God. So the main characteristic of the period of the first apostolic church was that this, the, this uh, division and hatred that was created by people toward the Christians. The second was the persecutions that they suffered in the last apostolic church and the beginning from the Israelites. And then wherever the gospel was preached by everyone else, beginning from the Israelites but also the Gentiles. The third characteristic was the growth of sin during that period, lawlessness, and finally the patience and endurance that these people needed to, to survive through this period of, of persecution in the First Apostolic Church. The same characteristics for the First Apostolic Church we find also in the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, from verse 9 to verse 13, and the characteristic uh, these characteristics end with the verse, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. But today we will read about what is mentioned in the gospel according to Luke, and as we read in, verse, in chapter 21, from verse 20 to verse 24. We'll, we'll concentrate on this, and this is the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 A.D., Let's read again. It was the prophecy that gr the Christ gave, and the disciples knew. For that reason, when they saw the signs that we will read about right now, only the true Christians escaped, history says as well, because they left Jerusalem when they saw the signs taking place. And those who remained in Jerusalem were, de were destroyed, and the people of Israel were scattered throughout the whole world. So before he was crucified, Jesus Christ said this, this was in the last week after the Sunday of uh, when he entered into Jerusalem, after he entered Jerusalem to be crucified. There, he he gave this doctrine concerning this teachings concerning the latter days. He says in verse twenty, "But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near." And history writes that Titus surrounded Jerusalem and he was ready to destroy her. But messages came from Rome and he left Jerusalem for a short uh, time span. But it was enough for the Christians who saw the surrounding of Jerusalem because the Lord said that its desolation is near. When they saw this, the Christians left. And when the Christians left, then Titus returned and he destroyed Jerusalem. And he continues in verse 21. 
Then let those who are in Judea, when you've seen the, the armies, then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let those who are in its midst of her, let not those who are in the midst of her depart, and let those who are in the country not enter her. So the sign was the surrounding of Jerusalem by armies and the besiegement. And the commandment was, when you see this, leave. And the question was, how will we leave when Jerusalem is surrounded? And the answer came from God. Because Titus left from Jerusalem for a short time, that was enough so that the believers may escape. Why should they escape? Verse 22. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. These are the days of vengeance of God on Jerusalem, so that all that is written, all things that were written, may be fulfilled. Everything that was written concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. And now he continues, for those who remain, who stayed there, because the Christians left, or for the Christians who did not trust the words of Christ, and this is a very important thing here, that we have to take always into serious consideration. We must trust the words, the written words especially of God, the words of Christ, because they will definitely be fulfilled. So it says, Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babes in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, the people of Israel. <coughs> and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. So here we see in great detail, and I'd say prophetic historical detail, prophetically for the history of the future, God speaks at that time in absolute detail, in great detail. The surrounding of Jerusalem, whoever can escape will find a chance and they will escape. And when the armies return, then a great destruction will take place because these are days of vengeance of God so that everything that's fulfilled in the Word of God, may, written in the Word of God, may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant. Why? They butchered women, historians say, and they pulled out their children. They slayed men and women because the Israelites swallowed their gold, gold and treasures so that, so that they don't take them from them. But the Romans slayed everyone in Jerusalem, but all this was prophesied. For that reason, my dear brethren, let us be careful at what we say and how we think. We are definite, we are certainly grieved and saddened when we see the earth and the creation groaning and, uh, and mourning. Everything is burning around us. But it must never escape our mind that which the Word of God says. All these things must happen first, and then the end will come. We do not expect the earth now to be, become more beautiful, and the times that are coming in humanity to be better. On the contrary, the Word of God assures us that evil times will come in the latter days, and indeed they will be like the pains of a pregnant woman, of a laboring woman. And the same way that a woman is pregnant, she's approaching her to the time of giving birth, suddenly a first small pain comes, and she wonders, is this a birth pain? And how will she understand if this is a birth pain, a labor pain? Because this pain will come again, a bit stronger. Again, she'll wonder, is this labor pain? And how will she understand this? Why? It will come again. And it will be stronger and soon her the next time. And then she, the woman begins to understand and says, let's go, I'm giving birth. And again, pain comes stronger and sooner. And then again pain, bigger. And the things that are happening now, my dear brethren, have the same, the same allegory, let's say, in the same nature. The fires, let's say. The last ten years we've had fires. But now we see fires happening more often and more intensely. Of course, not only in Greece, throughout the whole earth. Why? Because it is written. Nature groans and mourns with us. You want us to see this before we go on? 
let us go to the epistle to the Romans. So we can read this, this great truth of the Word of God and the prophetic Word of our Lord in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. So we can see here how the Word of God describes this, this pain of nature. And it's not only there, elsewhere we see that the, the curse comes upon the whole earth and growing uh, rhythm. But here we read in verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of God. Sons of God. All creation eagerly awaits the revelation of the sons of God. There are sons of God. There are children of God. They are the ones who have received Jesus Christ, who are born again, who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, who have in their hands the Word of God, and they live with the Word of God, and their life is directed toward prayer and the presence of God. But furthermore, the children, but still, the children of God have not been revealed yet. And all of creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God, the revealing of the sons of God. Why? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. All of creation has been subjected under the devil, not because nature desired this, but because God was forced to do this. I remind you, when God created paradise, He placed Adam and Eve in there so they can serve and protect it and work it. But with their transgression, Adam and Eve stopped serving in the uh, Garden of Eden. That is, they lost the presence of God. And so God was not the one that, who, through Adam, earthly Adam, the first Adam, God who was supposed to protect all of earth. Because of Adam's transgression, God could not protect earth anymore. But the moment will come later on, as we will see, when the sons of God will be revealed and manifested, and the new Adam will be revealed with them, Jesus Christ, who will um, regenerate the earth, and He will reign for a thousand years upon the earth, when having bound the devil. But let us carry on. Verse 21. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So now creation is in bondage of corruption. In other words, it is enslaved to corruption. It is corrupted slowly, slowly. It's not regenerated. It's not revived, this nature. It fades. It, it's corroded. It corrodes on earth especially which is the place that God created so He can set man. The earth, land is lost. Deserts are growing. A great ecological problem of the whole world is the desert, the people, the land turns to deserts, to wilderness. Secondly, water becomes less and less. Healthy, clean water becomes less and less and is not enough. It becomes shorter and shorter. There's shortage of water. At the same time, the waters are defiled and polluted, like the, earth, like the, the sea is defiled and polluted. The atmosphere is polluted intensely. And then we have the well-known effect of, the, of global warming. Whereas God has, God has, a, has planned, though, and He's measured everything on earth, the waters and the sea and the land. If the le waters will be left loose, then the earth will be covered with water. There is a lot of tons of water in the clouds. Great measures of water are in the ice caps on the top and the bottom of the, on the northern and southern pole. And a lot of water is in the sea. But water that is drinkable, water that is clean, is cleansed and renewed by an amazing mechanism that God has set in place 
And this amazing cleansing uh, filter, which is called the sea, as the water falls into the sea, then it evaporates, turns to clouds, and falls again as clean water. It is amazing what God has done. And these balances that He has set up for man in this small pr planet that is called Earth. Why? So man can be preserved alive. But we know that creation is in bondage of corruption. It will be corrupted and corrupted and more and more. And though people will be building and building, God will destroy. And though people will be planting, they will be burnt, these plants. Because it is a period of corruption. But he continues. I'm reading again from verse 21. And subject and hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, from the bondage of corruption, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And there are the children of God. They exist. Indeed, in the last century, and the last generation, there are children of God, which is the last apostolic church, and we will see this later on at the plan and the work of God of the latter days. Verse 22, For why, in other words, does this creation hope that it will be delivered? For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs. Nice words here. Groans together. Groans together. And labors with pain together with someone else. With whom? Until now. And not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. We groan within ourselves and earth groans with us. We are anxious. The earth, whole uh, creation is anxious for us. But we also have the, we are the fruits, first fruits of the Spirit, eagerly wait for the adoption. In the same way that na nature is hoping to be taken into the glorious liberty of the children of God, so also we are eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, that is, that is the resurrection, that is the rapture of the church. So, until the rapture of the church, we Christians will be groaning and we will be laboring for all these great evil things that will be happening around us which will be famine, which will be troubles, which will be great earthquakes in places, which will be floods, which will be destructions, which will be fires, which will be curses, all these great things. And we groan and moan and suffer through all these things. People suffer, but they do not know what's going on. We suffer and we know what's going on. And what does this mean that we know what's going on? We have hope that all these things are happening and are due to sin of man, to lawlessness of man and unbelief of man. But glory be to God. God reveals these things to us so that we do not become despair we don't become desperate. We groan and labor with birth pangs, but we're not disappointed because we know the Lord is coming to receive us. And He will receive us before the great pains of the great sorrows of the seven year period of the Antichrist will begin. So this is our hope, but it is also our good fear that we be ready on that day so that we may be counted worthy to escape all these things that are going to take place on the face of the earth. Hallelujah. So let us go back to where we were. The Gospel according to Luke. Where we read about the destruction of Jerusalem. But there is also a marvelous verse that we have to stand upon. Uh, again, we're in Luke 21, verse 24. And we're reading. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, the Israelites and be led away captive into all nations, the Israelites. And now we're entering the amazing sign that only God could find a way to describe to us and to reveal it to us. And Jerusalem 
will be trampled by Gentiles. Jerusalem was, is, and will continue to be trampled by many nations. It will never be governed by one nation, by one conqueror, by one nation. But many nations will have a part in it. Today there are many nations, and there were always a lot of nations that were over and oppressed Jerusalem. Now they are the Palestinians and the Israelites. Today there are Syrians as well there, and I don't know who else is there. Americans are through the, the, the Jews there. The Russians through the Palestinians are there. All nations are there and have turned their attention to Jerusalem. But before I go on, I want us to look at another amazing sign that is found in the Word of God about Jerusalem. Let us go to Zechariah the prophet. Chapter 12 from the book Zechariah the prophet. In verse 2, let us see two amazing characteristics, two amazing prophetic characteristics that the Word of God reveals for Jerusalem. So Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2. Behold, I will make, I God, will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. And he's talking eschatological for the latter days. And truly, all this time from 70 AD until today and until the end, Jerusalem will be for all the surrounding peoples, what, Persians, Iranians, Arabs, Israelites, Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, uh, Protestants, Syrians, Palestinians. It will be a cup of drunkness. Listen to this description. All nations are drunk by it, are dizzy. Everyone wants Jerusalem. First sign. The second sign. And when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And truly, back then the siege took place. But there is a last siege that will take place as well. In the end, which we will see again, when all nations will come to besiege Jerusalem to destroy it. And the Word of God says that they will not manage to destroy it because an earthquake will take place that is so strong that the armies will be destroyed and they will leave vanquished. And this war, this earthquake, and the Bible cannot be found, or at least I, or it hasn't been revealed to us if it will happen before the rapture or after the rapture. But still, this war and the series of our lessons, this plan and this work of God in the latter days, I believe we will find it as well. But let us see the third sign as well. Verse 3. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy, heavy stone for all peoples. The end, in other words, that day, in the latter days of the latter days, I will make Jerusalem, God will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone. No one will be able to withstand it. No one will be able to, to lift it. And all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. As we said, which will be this last attack of all nations against Jerusalem. <laughs> but again, we return to the Gospel according to Luke, where we were reading before and again from 21, half of 24, it says, And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And here is this beautiful prophetic sign that it will be trampled by many nations until the rapture of the church takes place. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And the times of the Gentiles are the period of grace, 
that began around 33 A.D. On the, in the upper room was a descent, was a blessing and promise and baptism of the Holy Spirit on the first apostolic church. And it will be concluded with a departure. In the same way that the Holy Spirit came down through Jesus Christ upon the church, it will be concluded with a departure of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ with the church into heaven, a thing which is this amazing phenomenon that all people know about. I don't say that all people believe it, but all people have heard of it now. The amazing event of the rapture of the church. Here we will examine this phenomenon of the rapture of the church, which we read about in the Gospel according to Luke, but we may also see it, we can see it as a sign in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. It is the last apostolic church here. A short time before the rapture. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Again, we're talking, uh, that we're saying that we're reading from 24:14 from Matthew. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. The end of the church upon the earth. In other words, it is the last preaching of the gospel and the beautiful characteristic of this verse is that the gospel will be preached this gospel because in our times unfortunately many gospels are preached but not this gospel which is the true gospel the healthy doctrine but many go doctrines every church and every religion has its own gospel its own doctrines the Orthodox Church have their own gospel they follow. In which gospel they have added a whole lot of traditions. And they have disfigured it completely. They have added prayers and glorifications uh, to the Virgin Mary. They have added different mediators, even though there's one intercessor mediator between man and God, man Christ Jesus. They have added all the saints in there. They have uh, given specializations to the saints, the, the God of the sea, of the, of the, of the land, of war, uh, of love, Valentine. And every saint has an office. Or the Catholic Church, they have their own doctrine as well, their own gospel. Again, they have saints, and this and that and the other. And it wouldn't be right for us to go through the, their past, the Inquisition, they gave letters of forgiveness. Here, take this. Give me money and your sins are forgiven. This is a different gospel completely. Then the Protestants came around. And they have a different gospel as well. The gospel of prosperity came from that. Christ will make you rich, they say. Gospel of uh, predestination. That everything is destined. He is destined to go to hell and he is destined to go to he heaven. So, even Judas is innocent because God had destined him to give Christ up, they say. Another gospel. Again, no, I'm t there are many different. Salvation cannot be lost, they say. From the moment that you become born again, that's it. You can't lose your salvation, they say. But the Word of God says, be careful, keep watch and pray. Ten were the virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. There is a believer and wise servant. But there is also a wicked servant who went to the outer fire. There is someone who wasn't wearing uh, a wedding garment in this parable of Christ, who was at a wedding. He was cast into the lake of fire. Where do they find these doctrines then? But now we won't be here to judge. We will say this, it is written, and this is the truth, that this gospel, this gospel here, this healthy doctrine, the truth of Christ will be preached in the latter days throughout the whole world, and then the end will come. The end of the church here, with the rapture, but also the end of the world, 
later on. But now and today, for a short time, we'll spend some time on the rapture of the church, which is an amazing uh, event of humanity, as we said. And I want us to read first from the epistle to the Thessalonians, so that we may see how nicely the Word of God describes it. First epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, and verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 4, the epistle of the Apostle Paul to Thessalonians, the first in verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring, him, will bring with Him those who sleep, in Jesus. So the ones who have died in Christ Jesus, God will bring with Jesus to heaven. For this we say to you, and pay attention before I go on, God will bring them through Jesus Christ to heaven. Christ will do the rapture, but by the commandment of God, God will give him the order. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord Jesus. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, and indeed the scripture doesn't, the ancient text doesn't say this, and at the same time it says, at the same time, with the resurrection of the dead, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. At the same time, the resurrection, and at the same time, the transformation that we will see. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. This is the fulfillment, again, of the prophetic word of God, that the Apostle John, our beloved disciple of Christ, mentioned. When we will go up there, he says, we do not know what we will be, but one thing we do know is that we will be just like Christ. We will take the body of Christ. This is exactly what we read in the epistle to Romans, that we groan as well, eagerly waiting for our adoption, that is the redemption of our bodies, that is the rapture, that is our resurrection. But in a different way now, he, he, the Apostle Paul refers to the rapture, and as well in the first epistle to Corinthians, let us see the reference. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 51. First Epistle to Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery, and indeed, my brethren, the, the rapture is a mystery. It is not revealed to everyone. All have heard about it. And I said earlier that all have heard in this world concerning the rapture, but they do not all believe it. And they do not all believe it, even Christians as well, because they don't understand it. And why do they not understand it? Because it's a mystery. And what does mystery mean? It needs to be revealed to you so you can understand it. And to whom does God reveal? To those who seek Him. To those who want Him. To those who really with great desire, want to know the truth of the gospel. So to those people that God says that by the Holy Spirit, God leads them to the depths of God. It's a mystery. And though theologists, theologians, chief priests, scribes and Pharisees of modern times have not understood the rapture, a small child, if you ask in the Church of Christ, what is a rapture? He'll answer you. He knows. An illiterate believer knows about the rapture. 
But we all know of it. Are we wiser than them? Are we more clever? God forbid. No. It is the grace of God. For that reason, we must thank Him and glorify God for His grace. Still, all these things are so clearly written that you wonder and say, but why do they not understand it? And the answer is one. Behold, I tell you, a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We will not all die, we Christians. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. As we read in the epistle to the Thessalonians. For it is necessary that this corruptible put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality. Why is this? Because in verse 50, a bit earlier than this, it says, Now this I say, my brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. For that reason, it is necessary that this corruptible put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality, so that they may inherit the kingdom of God that flesh and blood cannot inherit. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then the written, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Then, indeed, we have overcome death. As it is written, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting, <coughs> death is swallowed up in the victory. <coughs> death has been vanquished because Christ, who first entered into heaven, as it is written, you are my son. He's talking about man Christ Jesus here. Today, I regenerated you, I give birth to you. And so through Jesus Christ, we all shall enjoy our adoption, that is the redemption of our body, that is our resurrection, that is the rapture of the church. But we have to point out that the rapture of the church is not one moment. It is a procedure. And the procedure is made up of three stages. First, there is a calling. And I believe that this calling is the... Is the, the calling is the commandment that God gives to Christ to descend. Because the Word of God reveals to us that no one knows the time or day, nor the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, Christ Jesus, does He know. But only God, Christ Jesus, the Word of God that is, knows, of course. But man, Christ Jesus, who was raised from the dead and sitting on the right hand of God, does not know. So he needs a commandment toward all of us, an order toward, sent out to all of us, and his, the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And then there will be a calling, and a voice of an archangel. The voice of the archangel and this is described in the parable of the ten virgins, when it says, in the midst of night there was a calling, calling of the archangel, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, Go out to meet him. It is the voice of the archangel. And then, we're talking about the procedure now. Then all the virgins stood up, virgins stood up, the five foolish, along with the five wise ones, so that they may prepare their lamps to adorn them, as the parable says. They had time. Because all ten, the lamps of all ten virgins had gone out. And they, the lamps had gone out because they were all sleeping. Because the, the bridegroom was late. But the five who were foolish, because they were not ready, that is why they were foolish, and they didn't have oil with them, they could not adorn their, their lamps to prepare themselves. So they went to the five wise ones who had oil, and they could prepare their lamps. And they told them, give us. Because our lamps are going out. And the wise one said, What we have is only enough for us, because salvation, my brethren, is personal. The fact that my wife is ready for heaven does not mean that I am ready for heaven. 
And I will not enter the rapture of the church due to my wife because of my wife. Neither will my wife enter because of me. The ready ones will enter. Those who are ready with the presence of God and with the Holy Spirit. Who easily and immediately can be filled in the Holy Spirit because he who sanctifies us is the paraclete, the spirit of truth. So the five left went off to find oil to buy, it says in the parable. But then the bridegroom came. Those who were ready entered into the wedding. But when the five ones, five foolish returned, they couldn't go in. And they began to cry, Lord, Lord, open to us. And the Lord answered, I do not know you. Go away from me. For the Lord knows His own. The steady foundation of God remains. From the beginning He knew of us and informed us that from the ten, the five are wise and the five are foolish. God foreknows you. For God, there's no past, present and future. God will not understand in the rapture of the church who is ready and who is not so He can take Him up. God knows from beforehand. We will realize if we are in it or not. And woe to us, woe to some who will understand that they were not ready. Because they hadn't been diligent enough and made sure to have everything necessary. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit and sanctification and preparation. All the necessary things that the Word of God gives to us so that they may enter the kingdom of heaven. Because when the Word of God says, Seek peace with all men and sanctification. Because then only will you see the face of God. He means it. He doesn't say it for a joke. He means it. <laughs> the man who is not in sanctification isn't ready. And sanctification comes by the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. With faith with love, with hope, with all the necessary means from the Word of God. If you lack something, then you are not ready. For that reason, my dear brethren, let us ask from God to prepare us. And the only way for us to prepare ourselves is the Word of God and prayer. But prayer, not only with human words, but especially by the Holy Spirit. And I remember, years ago, a brother, an evangelical brother, very good brother, he's old, he, he used to be old, he left, he went with the Lord. He asked me, I do not understand why I need to speak in unknown tongues. Can you explain this to me? In sincerity, he asked me, and in kindness. And I gave him the answer that I had, in sincerity and in goodness. I was a young brother. I told him, I do not know what to answer you now, but I am sure that you love God, and that God loves you. And if you ask Him, He will answer you. And when He answers you, come and tell me as well. And after a few months, we got together again. And he told me, I know why I need them. And I told him, tell me. He said, I was sleeping, this old man said. Now he's with the Lord, definitely with the Lord. I was in my village, he said, in my sleep, in my old house. And there in my village... I was a young child back then. My father had a well. And this well was our whole livelihood. Because there was no water. We, we took water from this well. We, we bathed from this water. We drank from this water. We cooked from this water. We lived from this water. And my father took great care of this water. He had built around it. And he had uh, put up a, a, an iron lid with which he covered it a lot because garbage no animals or garbage were to fall in there because otherwise the water would go bad 
would be defiled. And I was at my father's home. Listen to this dream. You don't need to interpret, interpret it. It's so revealing. I found myself in my father's house. I went to the well, and the well was uncovered. And I was afraid and startled. I said, oh my, it will be filthy. And I looked down, and it was full of water. But it was very dirty. It was garbage. It was woods. Uh, there was leaves. It was filth. And I was very saddened, very grieved, because I didn't know how to clean it out. It was so deep that I couldn't clean it with any vessel. But it was also so high that it was full of water. <laughs> I couldn't use anything to, to take out the, the, the filth. I was completely weak. So then I turned my eyes up to heaven. I said, Lord, please clean this well. And suddenly I heard a noise. And the water began to swell, began to swell. And it swole and swelled and swole and swole. And then it became to oh, pour out. And as soon as it began pouring out, in one minute it was completely clean. And he said, now I understand what it means that rivers of leaving water will pour out, not of your heart, but of your stomach. And it says that he was talking about the Holy Spirit that the believers were going to receive. He who speaks in unknown tongues edifies himself. Do we need unknown tongues? Of course we do. It is the gift that God gave to men so that they may clean their, their vessels in one moment, immediately, quickly, with all certainty, with great results. And there is no other way for the well to be cleaned except if it becomes a fountain of living waters. And there is no other way for man to clean himself, except if he becomes a fountain of living waters. And you know how happy I became when I heard this. I said, God reveals. But can I tell you something else? I understood it then as well. I hadn't understood why it was needed. The five foolish virgins were not ready. They could not sanctify themselves. themselves. They were not ready. But those who were wise were ready. They put some oil in their lamps. And, and that is why, my dear brethren, the rapture of the church isn't just a moment. It is the grace of God for us. It is a procedure that lasts a short time, of course. So short that whoever is ready has time to prepare himself. But this Whoever isn't ready is enough time for him to, be pre to prepare himself. But also it's enough time for those who are ready to prepare themselves. He lifts up his hand to heaven. He calls upon the name of Christ. He gets filled in the Holy Spirit. Everything filthy leaves his body and his soul and spirit. And he flies off to heaven. It is the grace of God. This in one moment in the, in the twinkling of an eye is the transfiguration. Of course, the transformation will take place in one moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and the last trumpet of God. <coughs> but beforehand, the calling will have uh, preceded this, and the voice of the archangel. And the question is now, will everyone understand that this is the rapture? I do not know if everyone will understand this, but I know that all Christians will understand it, and those who are ready and those who are not ready. The five foolish understood it, and the five wise understood it. And it will be terrible for you to realize that the Lord is coming to take His church, and you don't see your body being transformed. And here there's meaning. Two will be in one bed. One who is ready will be taken. The other who is unready will be left behind. Two will be in the field and working there. One will be taken, who is ready, the other will be left behind. And two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other will be left behind. Unbelievable. A terrible, an amazing thing with the rapture of the church. And you know something? We will be without excuse if we are not ready. Because... Preparation isn't something impossible. It may be difficult. 
To some of us it may be even impossible. But what is impossible with men is possible with God. God does not want you to be able because He knows that we can't. We are not able. God doesn't want you to know a lot of things, for you to be a theologian and a professor of theology and the whole Word of God to be revealed to you and all this and that. No. God can do these things. He can give you strength and reveal things to you. But God wants one thing from you. And today let us take this as a message of God for us. He wants you to desire with your whole heart. You know what the Apostle Paul says so we can understand this better. He says, I understand that I'm becoming a burnt, uh, poured out offering now. And my time of departure is at hand. But I am ready. For I have r ran the good race. I have ended my faith. Uh, I've kept my faith. And I have ended my road. And nothing's left for me now than the crown of righteousness. That on that day the righteous judge will bestow to me. And he says, not only to me but to everyone who earnestly desires, fervently desires the appearance of the Lord. That is what God wants from us. He wants us to earnestly desire the rapture of the church. <clears throat> what does I earnestly desire mean? Not I desire, but I earnestly, I fervently desire with my whole heart. And God helps us desire earnestly through these fires, through the earthquakes, through the famines, through the diseases, through all these great signs that are coming like the pains of a laboring woman, and we understand these things, and God wants us to desire it more and more. May our heart not be bound, neither with earth, neither with, with forests. We love them. They belong to our Lord. Our soul is saddened when we see forests burn, but we are not despaired. And we do not become despaired because we say, the Lord is coming. I heard people speaking and saying, such forests, only our great-grandchildren will see again. With full of despair. And I said, these forests will be reformed by Christ when He will come down to earth with all the saints. And the earth won't be like this as it groans and labors and pains. But it will be beautiful. And we will be kings and priests of the Most High with Him. Amen. May the Lord bless us all.